What's up, everybody? Welcome into the H&M Trucking Podcast. I am your host, Marcus. Thank you all so much for being here today. Where are you at out there? Where are you rolling right now? Are you out I-80 or you maybe I-5 out here on the West Coast with me? Maybe you've got uh, maybe you're somewhere obscure, like on a highway, like Highway 62, maybe Highway 99 out here on the West Coast with me. Highway 30. That one only runs from Newport, Oregon to Boston. Interact with us is what I'm saying. Tell us where you're at. Tell us where you're headed, where you're going and what you want to hear. We do social media posts for this podcast on all of H&M's channels every single week. And all you got to do is toss us a comment there and I will see it. So what are we talking about today? Well, that's a really good question. Let me pull up my calendar here so I know exactly what we're talking about today. It's the quarterly outlook. Uh, Yeah, that wasn't as exciting as I had hoped, but it is exciting when you think about all the things that we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about uh, freight. We're going to talk about equipment and sales. I've got James Fonda coming up later, president of H&M, to talk about the health of the company looking forward. We'll have Tim Kruger from JFL Logistics on. He's going to talk about the freight market mostly, not only what it's doing right now, but what he expects it to do in the future, and we'll also get Hopper Division Manager Brenda Hampton on this show as well. Plus, we've got another great driver profile for you. It's Rance Millam. All of these are coming up, so just stay tuned. And we got another uh, appearance of our famous recurring segment this month. And this month, we're going to get into something we call the Bambi Report. What's the Bambi Report? Well, it's a lot like what it sounds like. What's going on out on the road? With the goddamn deer Uh, hunting seasons are well in effect all the way across this great nation, which means the wildlife is being pushed around, which means it's probably more likely that they're going to cross a highway or a freeway right in front of your beautiful new Volvo or Freightliner. So we'll talk about that later. I'm going to bring you a bunch of stats uh, kind of telling us about who is at the most risk to hit a deer when it comes to Uh, what state you're driving in, and also the amount of insurance claims that get filed in these states as well. It's some great information. It's going to wake you up a little bit, I hope. Um, But let's face it, you guys are all pro drivers out there. This is something that you deal with every single day of your lives. So it's probably not going to be as big of a surprise to you as it is to me. With that said, let's get to our first interview. From Omaha, Nebraska, to whatever lane you're driving... This is the H&M Trucking Podcast with your host, Marcus Bridges. It's been a few weeks since we've heard for him, so let's get Tim Kruger from JFL Logistics on the line because we're talking about outlooks here. We're talking about quarterly outlooks. I have no idea what that means. Let's bring the expert in. Tim Kruger, thank you so much for being here today, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me again, Marcus. Pleasure to always be on the podcast with you. Hey, we love having you. Uh, you and I could sit here and talk for hours at a time, but I'll try to keep it short. I do want to check in with you. Last time we talked, you were recovering from surgery. How's the recovery going? Are you back to 100% yet? Uh, nowhere near 100%. <laughs> um, <laughs> my uh, my knee is, I think I can bend it at like a 110 degrees, so... Uh, by, I think in another four weeks, I need to be at 125 degrees. So I think I'm coming along nicely and steadily and, uh, I'm just trying to get off these crutches. So hopefully on Monday, I'm off of them. So we'll see. Well, I hope you have a leather bite strap for when you do your, uh, physical therapy, because as I remember, that was more painful for me than the actual knee injury itself. So I I hope that's not eating you up uh, as bad as it did me when I was younger. Oh yeah, not 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 too much. Uh, my uh, brother is my uh, physical therapist. He's out of town right now, so I had some other uh, other trainer or uh, therapist work with me today, and he's a little more rough on me than my brother. So <laughs> it was a little painful today. <laughs> That's surprising, man. I would think a brother would take every opportunity he could to be a little rough on you. Oh yeah, you would think so. But he was my older brother, and he's probably you know taking it easy on me for all the pain he caused me growing up. <laughs> <laughs> good, good to hear it, man. Good to hear it. Well, uh, we are talking quarterly outlook here, and I brought you on for the freight side of things. We always get great info for you as far as uh, the freight market is concerned. I want to ask you kind of a two-part question here. Um, 
the last time we talked, I think, was was sometime just shortly after your surgery. So it hasn't been long ago. But from then until now and from now looking forward, what's your outlook on the freight market, Tim? Yeah. So last time we talked, we said we'd probably see a little bit of an uptick. Um, it's getting a little steady currently. Um, but right now, you know, I got some customer, customers coming back to me asking for, you know, rate concessions. They're asking us to stop really, our rates a little bit, which is not great to see. You know, we have been developing some lanes and getting some trustworthy uh, customers out there. And just recently here, we've had some customers come back to us and say, hey, can you sharpen your pencil a little bit? Um, which is really starting to, you know, get into a dark area as far as carriers go because, you know, right now it's starting to hit rock bottom to where carriers aren't going to be able to make it. Fuel is on the rise again. Uh, equipment's on the rise again. Insurance is on the rise. So uh, from last time we talked till now, it is getting a little rough. I think Q4, when you're going to see coming into, you know, peak season with Thanksgiving and Black Friday, uh, coming into Christmas and the new year, normally you see a lot of, a lot pick back up. So we're hoping a lot of, um, freight starts moving, you know, a lot of, you know, getting those toys in the stores for kids and getting clothing in and making deliveries happen. Hopefully you're going to see a small uptick. Usually Q4 is pretty good. So we're hoping for that uptick, but you know, the way things stand right now, I think it's going to be a little rough again. You know, I had a customer we do quarterly RFPs for and he's like, yeah, there's 70 people on this one. So sharpen your pencil. So it's just like, you know, <laughs> customers are really like, you better bring some cheap options or we're not going to give you anything. So I'm hoping, you know, last time I read, we saw a 4% decline rate from, you know, shipper or carrier providers and uh, service providers like myself, you know, before that was sitting at like 2%. So the more that gets rejected, the more opportunity that's out there to where you can get prices up. So in a 4%, uh, instead of out of 2% is something great you want to see. So we're hoping that one keeps climbing and we just need that to double. Once that doubles, I think you're going to see a good freight market again. So hopefully that will happen uh, at the end of Q4 or roll to Q1 and some things change here. So uh, we'll see what happens. Okay. So it, it's, I was, that was my next question was actually going to be about like Thanksgiving and Black Friday and, and the kind of boost that you guys see from that. Historically, does that, when you're in a down market like you are right now, uh, when you get that bump from Thanksgiving and Black Friday, do you see that extend further through quarter four and into into quarter one of the next year? Or is that something that's kind of a, a spotlight on the graph and then it goes right back to where it was before that? Yep. So you'll, you'll see an uptick. You'll see it kind of drive through Q4. You'll see it basically start at the end of November, or like mid-November to rolling in through like January 1 first week, second week, and then you see it kind of mellow out again. Yeah. Um, just because you you are trying to get those, you know, all, all the gifts in, everything's people buying as far as the consumer. So you see all that come in, but then, you know, it'll mellow out. You see a drop come, you know, end of January, February, March. February, you see a small uptick because of uh, Valentine's Day. So you see a lot of flower shipments. You see a lot of candy shipments. You see a lot of that go out. So you do see that. So, you know, you try and ramp up Q4, um, get those numbers up, and then because you will mellow out around the start of Q1. For sure. Well, I mean, if you're out there listening to this podcast and you want to help the freight market, then buy an extra teddy bear. You know, send mom some flowers on on uh, <laughs> Valentine's Day. Uh, you know, sisters, all of those. They all love it. So just get and hey, it takes a lot of teddy bears to make up 80,000 pounds. So let's oh, yeah. let's get these trucks loaded, man. Well, <laughs> Listen, Tim, I, you know, we covered it a little bit last week. Um, diesel prices, you mentioned it already. Uh, there's, there are some states where diesel is up above six damn dollars a gallon. Uh, most notably my neighbor to the South, California. We can oh, yeah. always depend on them for horrendous prices, but do you see uh, any type of turnaround in the near future for diesel prices? No, I think they're still going to kind of go up here a little bit. You know, I think that was expected. So I think you're going to see some higher prices here. But, you know, when you see those higher prices, you really got to go back to your customers and just say, hey, look, like we need a little bit more, you know, fuel's high. And, you know, we went to one of our customers and told them, hey, it fills up like we need, you know, a couple extra dollars here. And they're like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. No. It's like, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, you're going to take it out on us. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I don't see usually around the winter months, you see it kind of rise a little bit. So I think, uh, I think diesel's still going to go up. Like you said, Cali six bucks. I think here in the Midwest or on Nebraska, you're looking at like four fifty. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we use that as like, if we got Cali frame, we're like, Hey, like, I know you want this low. We're going to get you out at six bucks for diesel. You're, I'm going to get you to like 450, 423, you know? And, um, so we always try to use that as a sales tactic too, to help, you know, sell our freight, get them on trucks. I like it. You need to keep your pencil sharp, but their pencil's broken. Uh, so yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> and I hate that. I hate seeing that because we love the carriers we work with. We we want them to keep running. We want them to be profitable. So we try and do everything just on the logistics side and three PL side to really push for carriers. And you know we're we're owned by H and M, so we we know exactly how to run a truck and the price it needs to be at. So. Um, if it's not, you know, in our price range to where that truck's going to, you know, be profitable, we're not going to take it. So hopefully that can change here in the near future. Hopefully we're all, we've all got our fingers crossed. And, uh, I, I love having you on for these updates because I feel like you have a unique insight and, uh, you, you obviously know the industry and, uh, we will have you back on probably sometime during that uptick. If we can get a hold of you, I know you're going to be busy. Here's hoping that the recovery continues going well for your knee and that the freight market uh, follows suit and then turns up and gives us something to be excited about next year. Yep, absolutely. I can't wait to be back on, too. All right, Tim. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Yep. Thanks, Marcus. Appreciate it. That's Tim Kruger, JFL Logistics. Knowledge and stories from coast to coast. This is your driver profile. It's driver profile time here on the H&M Trucking Podcast, and today I have H&M driver Rance Milam on the phone. Rance, how you doing out there, man? Pretty good. Weather's nice, overcast, not too much sun. I like it. I love it. Well, thanks for being here today. Uh, where are you at and where are you headed? Well, I'm on 75 northbound and to Knoxville, Tennessee for tomorrow. And you're a southeast regional driver, is, is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay, so I have to ask because I hear so much on this podcast from other drivers about how much they hate Atlanta. There's two big ones. I say it all the time. It's the entire state of California or it's that they hate driving through Atlanta. You're down there a lot, I assume. How how do you like it? What's What are your thoughts on driving through Atlanta in a fully loaded truck? <laughs> it's pretty punishing. Um, problem is it's got three interstates going in there, 85, 75, and 20. And plus being a council of Georgia, that um, you be really hairy, and that's very, very, a lot of backup everywhere you go. Yeah. You know, I've only yeah. actually been to Atlanta one time, and it was just to fly in, and then I drove to a very small town called Lincolnton, Georgia. And uh, mm-hmm. the whole time I was in Atlanta, I was stuck in traffic. That's my entire experience with that city. Yep. Yeah, that's what 285 is. Backed up. <laughs> backed up man well i i gotta ask you this because it's another one that i like to ask uh, drivers when they come on for a profile what's your truck number and uh what color is your truck since you know you drive for the rainbow fleet well it's uh 2486 and it's kind of a um a purple tint which i really like kind of like a darker purple or is it like a bright purple well kind of like a mid-color purple um I don't know. I actually don't even know what the real color looks like, but this to me, uh, it's almost like a dark blue to a purplish tint. It all depends how the sun hits the uh, truck at different times. Yeah, that's that's kind of cool. Do you keep it pretty clean? Are you one of those guys that likes to to drive around in a nice, clean, shiny truck, or does that bother you very much? I try to have it washed every time I can, uh, when possible, because they give us two truck wash a month to keep it washed on the outside. And how about on the inside? Are you a neat freak when it comes to uh, the inside of the truck? I only want to have visitors. <laughs> Just like me at my house, man. Every time I got people coming over here to stay, I'm spending the week before cleaning like an idiot. Yes, that's that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so how how long have you been driving? Uh, for, well, how long have you been driving all together? And then how long have you been driving for H and M, Rance? Well, I've um, been going for uh, I think 25 years now, and uh, a couple of years with this with this, uh, this company out here, which is the. Uh, pretty nice i've drove for like five different companies and this seems to be the best of the best so far that i've driven for that's good is there any specific reason why well it's the people actually um they are a little more uh, friendlier and then uh, try to get you um you know if you need to be home or try to you know try to help out and i don't know when you need time off they don't make a big fuss about it, like oh company soon yeah 
It's something I've heard a lot uh, talking to H&M drivers that seems to be a very common theme. And I'm always happy to talk about it because uh, you guys don't deserve to be treated like a number. You deserve to be treated like family. And I, I hear that a lot from H&M drivers that that's the way that it goes. And and I know from my personal conversations with James uh, that that's exactly how he wants it. So it's always good to hear that uh, that that's the case. You don't have to name them, but the worst company you've driven for, what was it like there? Probably would be that one um, that went out of business. It only lasted like, like a year and a half. I don't know what his name was. Uh, there's two guys. Um, I don't know if the guy has all spent so long now. <laughs> uh, but it was uh, pretty bad. He was... Uh, he was an ex driver and his dad was an ex driver and, and they say a lot of times ex drivers made a good dispatch. I can sometimes disagree with that because they, they want to argue and fuss and carry on. I think that uh, based on what I've heard that the, the best dispatchers that are former drivers are the ones that don't argue with you because they understand what you're going through out there. It's not the other way around. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just had to, um, Two dispatch that I drove for a long time, and I've had fits with them, and I've had I've been, I had to leave them because uh, they uh, they create too much of a problem for me. Sure, because I I enjoy driving, and when you make when you turn driving into a, a hassle or or not making it fun anymore, I don't even like that. And I there's gonna be too much there's, just, there's just, just too much going on here. There's some more more people that need drivers out here. Sure. Well, hey, man, a 25 year career is, is nothing to scoff at. Uh, you've been at it for a quarter century. What, how'd you get your start? Uh, obviously, you said you like driving. Is that just where it came from? You're just like, man, I want to be in a rig and, uh, truck driving was the, was the best way to do that. Or, or what, what gave you your start in your career? Well, you know, I was a production company for about 15 years and we had to make these quotas. And you know, I just finally got to look. I said, I'm just, uh, outside this building. I want to get out and move around and see the country a little bit. I don't see as much as I like to because I had to keep rolling. But so then I went in and went to a uh, class and uh, truck, truck driving class. And then I got my CDL and and then I went to hit the road and and that's basically it in a, in a uh, nutshell. Sure. Well, that's good. What's uh? So I've already asked you about Atlanta, which we all know the struggles that dr- uh, drivers face there at this point. But what's your favorite part of the country to drive through? I like the uh, Tennessee and the north and uh, some of the north, north and South Carolina, out where the where the area is more wooded and everything. Yeah, I'm more of an outdoors outdoors kind of guy. Oh, okay. So, do you ever get out uh, on any of your breaks when you're out on the road or anything like that for any outdoor recreation or, or camping or hunting or fishing or anything like that? No, I don't have time for that. Yeah. Most of the time, I just have time to get the point A to point B in a safety manner and uh, try to get some sleep and rest. I thought about it a few times, but, you know, we don't know when we're going to have some uh, dead time where I can take a rod and reel and whip it out there and try to fish a little bit in the canals or something that I see. Sure. I, I talked to a driver on here. Uh, it's been a while back and his name is escaping me. So forgive me if you're out there listening, but he's a pretty avid fisherman and he stops uh, whenever he can. He's always got a rod and reel on him. And even if he can only go out and, and throw, you know, two or three casts in, he's out there doing it. And I got to say, that's dedication because, uh, you know, y- you work a tough job like you need that rest. And sometimes it's got to be nice just to kick your feet up rather than always trying to go pursue a hobby out there. Oh, yeah. But, uh, he must be a hardcore fisherman. I'm just an avid fisherman just wants to do it once in a while. So that's a big difference between me and him, I guess. And uh, yeah, look at the, we, we all have our little outlets we like. Mine's just resting, basically. Yeah. Do you, uh, you get in some movies uh, out there on the when you're, you know, in your sleep or rest in, or do you, you uh, play video games or anything like that? Well, I I try to watch a little bit on DVD. Yeah, DVDs and um, I used to stream it on my phone once in a while when I have time to sit down and and uh, rest or in my sleeper and stuff like that. Nice. Yeah, it's a uh, it, it's crazy, man. Some of the technology I see in these trucks nowadays. Like I've seen guys with full gaming setups and and what looks like you know uh, the the best that they can make it as far as like a theater in there. You know, uh, have have the ambiance and everything. It's it's pretty cool if you're comfortable in your sleeper and if you if you like it in there, you like to be in there, you can make yourself right at home, man. It's just like a studio apartment. Yeah. Well, some people most most people probably are set up because they travel months at a time. We have some drivers that stay two or three months out there. But this one here we have XM radio and um and a refrigerator, so it's it's very handy uh what I have in this truck. That's great. 
do you uh, do you cook or or make any food in the truck? That's another thing that I hear some drivers are are getting into. Um, you know, trying to eat a little bit healthier out there on the road. Is is that anything that you get into? Well, um, I have a microwave and um, I try to eat up food. I try to cook some stuff over the over the weekend and then uh, bring it on the road with me to help out with uh, costs and try to eat a little bit. You know, eat chicken and stuff like that. Sure. Now, uh, well, on the same token, is there like a favorite place that you have to stop to get that meal when you're going to go by this place? You know, you're stopping there. Oh yeah, there's a barbecue place up here. Um, it's a two hundred one. I like to stop at. They want uh, they want you to well, let's pay parking. You got to pay fifteen dollars, or you get fifteen dollars of barbecue, and, which I could easily do that. <laughs> yeah, fifteen dollars of barbecue is nothing, man. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It ain't. I mean. <laughs> Prices, they, the prices are, but how they are, but uh, still, there's just good food. And whenever I get a chance, I sit down and and uh, do my two hour break there. I love to go there, and then um, hopefully uh, get into Orlando when it's not that uh, the rush hour. Sure, absolutely, man. Well, you know, it's it's funny how we all develop these little spots. There's a place up in Yakima, Washington, that I, I never get up there really, but it's called Minor Burger. And these burgers are giant and they're it's so good. And it's like you don't think of a burger restaurant as like that place that you have to go. But if I'm in Yakima, Washington, if I have the unfortunate experience of having to be in Yakima, Washington, I'm going to Minor Burger. No question. Wow. That sounds like one of those two two pound burgers or something. That I've seen they were tied. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, eat, eat this and get for free or whatever. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I feel like that when I walk out of there. That's for sure. So, um, do you have, you got uh family back home or anything like that? Or any kids that, uh, that wait on you f- for when you're getting home? Well, no, uh, they're all, they're all grown and well, I do have a yard to tend to. I need tending every, that's why I try to get home as much as I can to tend to the yard, cut the grass, you know, and do the yard work and help keep on the house. Of course, you know, there's a little routine stuff for sure. And where's home at? It's all been in Georgia. Okay. So are you a are you a Georgia Bulldogs fan? Oh uh, yes, I am. I've been there for uh, back in the days when Virgil Walker was running around. Yeah, man, that's it. That guy Herschel, was unbelievable. Virgil left, Virgil right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about the Falcons? Are you uh, so are you a big football fan, or are you just kind of a casual fan? Well, I follow, I follow more of the Steelers than I do the Falcon fan. My son and I go over there once a year to see a Falcon, and I run from them until Steelers come in town. <laughs> and of course, we're opposite end then. Yeah, fun of each other. I feel you there. Good times. Good. Well, I, I you, forgive me for asking about it, but football season's my favorite time of the year. I haven't shut up about football for weeks now, and I won't for you know eleven or twelve more at the very least. So I always have to ask if I if I can sense a football fan and. You Georgia Bulldogs, man, you guys are are born and raised in it down there, and uh, it, it's really cool to see. I, I'm an Oregon Duck myself, and we absolutely got lambasted by you guys last year, so I'm still licking my <laughs> wounds a little bit there. Yeah, um, this coach here we have, Kirby Smart, has really, um, really turned our, our uh, team around. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's good that we're back in the race and the hunt, and we've always uh, been on the on the tip of the uh, threshold, but we never, never crossed that line yet. So I'm pretty happy. Yeah. Well, good, man. Look, somebody had to knock Nick Saban off of his pedestal and just as good as you guys be in that team than anybody in my book, because I was just sick of hearing about Alabama all the time. Yeah. Well, especially you go to Alabama story, you hear this roll tie, you know, there, <laughs> yeah, here's all this stuff here. And then you, you say something where you, where you're from. And, you know, they start looking at you like you're a alien from another world or something. So <laughs> it's good today. that. It's good to get bumped out a few times and notches us, you know, and, uh, you know, and sit on top all the time. Hell yes, man. I, I 100% agree there. So, uh, you know, something that came up when I was, uh, I was talking to Eve about, um, getting you on the podcast. She was sending me your phone number and everything. She mentioned that you were just going to come on here and talk about how, uh, how great she was the entire time. Did you have anything to say to Eve? On the podcast, while well, she's uh, she's not able to respond, but definitely listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a very sweet person, and that's all I can say about her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to give you the chance, man. We love Eve at this podcast. She's a she's a recurring uh, presence here, and she's been so great helping me out getting drivers like yourself on. So. 
uh, a big salute and hats off to Eve. We're we're big Eve fans out here in uh, in the Pacific Northwest, so it's it's hard. You got to find something to fall in love with this time of year in the Pacific Northwest because it's just the weather's just garbage out here. You know, you you were talking about how nice it is where you're at. Appreciated a bit for me because it's gray and rainy here, and it's probably going to be like that for the next three months. Yeah, it's eighty right now, so we're getting the we're getting the where it's cool at night and in the mid eighties right now, the low eighties, and then sixty six in the, in the night time. So it's a pretty good weather. I like. Oh, that's great. That's great, man. Fall's the best time of year, in my opinion. Uh, and let's face it, my opinion and fifty cents won't buy you a hot cup of coffee. So to all of you listening out there, feel free to to formulate your own, of course. You know, I haven't asked this question for a really long time, but it's always here on my list of questions. Do you have any crazy stories, rants from out there on the road that you'd like to share with us? You've been driving for 25 years, so I know you've seen it all <laughs> at this point. Uh, but every driver's got a good story. Is there anything uh, that that comes to mind when I ask about a crazy story? Well, I'll tell you one. A long time ago at nighttime, and I have a bright zone, and I saw a dog in the middle of the road. I started to slow down, and then I realized the dog was transparent. And, uh, I got a little worried <laughs> and, uh, and so I slowed up some more and eventually the closer I got, the uh, dog disappeared. What? So it was like a ghost? Uh, well, I would have to say, um, yeah, because you, you know, I mean, you, you see, you see, this, I see the outline of a dog, you know, I saw the outline, but you know, I didn't, it, it wasn't solid. So I was saving something. That's crazy. So, are you like a, a believer in the supernatural? Or are you are you skeptical? Like, where do you stand on on ghosts and spirits and the like? Well, I like to keep an open mind, but I don't want to be you know we go one way or the other. I don't like to be uh, just open about it and, and just let the evidence prove for itself. If you have, like I said, I wouldn't I would never believe it. I saw a transparent dog, but I saw the outline of the legs and the head and the tail and everything. And well, it was there and it was there, so. That's no. that's crazy, man. <laughs> I like to keep an open mind, too. I don't like to be overly skeptical, but I also can get caught into this like rabbit hole of all of a sudden I've watched like three seasons of Ghost Adventures and I haven't left the couch and I'm convinced that it's real. Uh, and I have to bring myself back to reality from time to time because I've never had any experiences like that myself. Yeah, I watch Ghost Adventures off and on, too. I record them with DVR, but. Sometimes it gets they get a little carried away, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, but uh, you know they're one of the better shows because at least they're locked in the place and there for a few hours. They're actually inside the building or the mine where they're at. So I think they uh, swoop it up a little bit to make it more entertaining. Probably, I, I feel like that's got to be the the answer for all of those shows. Like, is if it's not entertaining, all of a sudden you don't have a job. So if you go in there and nothing talks to you you better figure out a way to make it sound like something talked to you, you know? It's one of the interest right now is this uh, expedition Bigfoot, where uh, these uh, people up there in uh, Alaska right now, you have a, uh, a lady primate, and you have some kind of guy that believes in Bigfoot, and then you have the uh, ranger or something. Uh, he's track, used to tracking things, and he's trying to track it down, and they got evidence, too. That is, it's crazy, man. Up, Bigfoot's huge up here in the Pacific Northwest. Everybody thinks, they, I shouldn't say everybody, there's a large contingency of people that think that sooner or later one day we're going to run across Bigfoot. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time out in the wilderness hunting. I've, I've been a hunter my entire life. And I will say this, I, I've never seen anything. I've never, uh, you know, I've never thought that I ran across a track or anything like that. But there are some weird sounds that happen out in the forest, especially at nighttime, that always make yeah. me wonder, like, what the hell is out there? Because whatever just made that sound, I've never heard it before. Uh, Clyde Lewis, the one that does Ground Zero. Uh huh. I listened to him one time on a podcast, and he he said he saw one up there for the Mount Everest. That's something. Yeah. He was staying with a friend. He hollered out, "Hey, he's a Bigfoot!" And the thing ran away. He saw he he just uh get scared it off. Man, there would be a yellow puddle in the snow next to me. I, I don't think I would handle it very well, man. It's like, I, I, and I'm armed when I go out there. I have a, I have a rifle to hunt with and sometimes a sidearm just in case, you know, run across a, an angry bear or something like that. But dude, if right. I saw a Bigfoot, like I'm, I'm hightailing it out of there. I might not even touch the ground until I get back to the truck. Well, I don't know if you ever watched that show I've been watching right now, Expedition Bigfoot, but, uh, they've got these, 
trees upside down uh, where the roots are standing up. And I don't, there's no marks of a, of a machine picking it up and putting it in the ground. So I'll, I'll be doing it. Man, Z, I'm not going to sleep tonight if I go start watching this, but you've already piqued my interest. So I am going to go watch it, Rance, for sure, because uh, it's something about it. You know, the unknown is always fun. And, and regardless of, of whether, you know, there's people out there listening to this podcast right now, listening to you and I talk about this going, these guys, these idiots. But I think it's fun. Like it's, you know, I, I went to we talked about ghost adventures. I went to Zach Baggins um, Supernatural Museum in Las Vegas and mm-hmm. it's 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 eerie in there. I, I got to say, like, and obviously it's been set up to make you feel uneasy. But there's one exhibit where you walk in and you're in like a prison cell and they've got all these artifacts from all these serial killers on the wall in there. And they've got the the death shroud from Charles Manson and they've got writings from Bundy and, and Gein and all these infamous uh, serial killers. Dude. I felt weird in there. I don't know why. I just I, I wanted to get out of that room. I, I think there's something to it, but I'm going to take a take a page out of your book and just keep an open mind and try not to get down the rabbit hole too far. Yeah, that's what you do is don't look, don't get uh, one way or the other. Just keep on the like in a neutral way and and just use your own judgment and your best uh, and use your best uh, whatever uh, you use, you know, uh, you got or whatever you want to do and say, hey, you know, this ain't real. That's it. Kind of like a Ripley, believe it or not, sometimes these, sh- these uh, museums are. Yep. They're set up to fool you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I'll take uh, I'll take some advice from James Fonda on this. I'll keep it between 10 and 2. He likes that. He likes to say that from time to time. Keep it between 10 and 2. Uh, I, I believe he's referencing where you used to be supposed to hold the steering wheel. I don't know if that's still a thing with airbags anymore. Seems like a good way to get a broken nose, but... You know, (laughs) (laughs) well, Rance, we're up against the clock here, man. I just want to thank you for for coming on and sharing some time and some stories with us today. And I also I want to give you the floor. If there's anything you want to say to your fellow drivers, if there's anything you want to say to the the front office back at H&M in Omaha or any of your family that might be listening, please. The floor is yours. Oh, all I can say is to all the drivers out there, male and female, do your best sit there and stay between the lines. and. Believe it or not, um, I will say this. You know, I'm asked a lot of times about first responders, and I'm one of those guys, and I believe the truck driver is. Because without us uh, out here to keep uh, America moving, a lot, a lot of people be without a lot of stuff there. These, these things we take for granted. So uh, I don't understand why we're not, you know, praised as much as the other guys are. I mean, fire department and police and nurse. I can understand that, but I also think we have a part to play in as well. I think you're a hundred percent right, man. I, I know it within three days, if you guys all decided to park within three days, it's Mad Max out here for the rest of us. We wouldn't have food. We wouldn't have any of the things. I mean, my internet would probably shut down. I'd be out of a job. So, uh, if, if no place else, know that, uh, on this podcast at the very least, we're greatly appreciative of what you guys do out there. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate giving a, a four, uh, the, the sound of my little. My little speech I just made. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You stay safe out there. Keep the shiny side up, and we'll be in touch with you again on this podcast. All right, Rance? Sounds great. Had a nice time here. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again. We'll talk to you soon, okay? All righty. All right. Bye. Bye bye. All right. It's time for us to get into the Bambi report. <laughs> I went with an eagle screech there because it, deer don't really make sounds. Well, they do. I, I've been I've been hunting deer my entire life, and and they do make a sound. They kind of snort like <laughs> it's weird. It, it's it, it sounds like something's coming to get you in the forest, but really there's nothing. It's just a deer. I guess cow elk sometimes they make kind of like a little pew pew. It's it, they people do it with a with a call in their mouth and a reed. It's it's stupid, and I don't have. Any of those on my button bar. Long story short, the only thing I've got is an eagle. Uh, so since we're talking about wildlife collisions, uh, the eagle is the choice of the day. Now, let's get right into it. I'm getting this information from the Insurance Information Institute. Uh, during deer season, which generally runs from October through December, there is a dramatic increase in the movement of deer population. Many of these deer find their way onto highways and into suburban neighborhoods. And as a result, more deer versus vehicle collisions occur in this period than at any other time of the year. 
According to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, from 1975 to the mid-2000s, there was a general upward trend in deaths from collisions with animals. However, this trend has leveled off in the past few years. Uh, There were 164 deaths from collisions with animals in 2021, occurring most often, of course, October through December. Now, we're also getting some data here from State Farm, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, U.S. drivers had an estimated 1.8 million animal collision insurance claims in the U.S. between July 22 and June 23. That's down from 1.9 million from the same period a year ago. So congratulations to all you professional drivers out there. We uh, crashed with 100,000 less deer year over year. That's got to be good news, right? Uh, Pennsylvania has the highest estimated number of auto claims at 153,397, but they are not the state that you are the most likely to hit an animal in. I've got the top five right here. For 22 to 23, this is the likelihood of animal-involved claims from a collision. Coming in at number five is Iowa. The Midwest shows up a lot on this list, and we'll get to more Midwestern states as we go forward with Wisconsin. Uh, excuse me, Iowa, you're you're at a one in 63 chance, okay? Uh, Wisconsin, one in 60. Michigan, one in 60. Pennsylvania, where they had the most claims, you are a one in 59 chance. That comes in at three on the list. This one's not surprising at all. Montana, one in 53. What's crazy about Montana is this uh, these stats are skewed because there's so few people in Montana that you don't have the the population out on the roads. But what you do have is an incredibly high population of animals in Montana. All right. It's the it's the big sky state. There's nothing over there. There's like a couple of towns and a city. And that's that's all of Montana. It's just mountains. So obviously Pretty high likelihood, one in 53, that you are going to hit an animal. But that pales in comparison to West Virginia, who comes in at number one on the list. One in 38 chance that you will have a collision with an animal in the state of West Virginia. That's crazy. Now, uh, I'm getting some of this from uh, State Farms Insights. I just wanted to kind of go through the regions where you're most likely to hit an animal because it's not going to surprise you for a lot of them, but some of them will surprise you. Some of the low risk states. Once again, we're kind of in a Montana thing here. When we talk about Alaska, one in 522 is your chances to have a collision with an animal. Uh, there's no roads. There's no people out there. It's all animals, but they do a pretty good job staying away from the roads because, you know, there just really aren't any. Um, Arizona is another one. A lot of West Coast states, you're at a pretty low likelihood. California, uh, one in 388. Colorado, one in 240. My home state of Oregon, one in 197. Texas is surprising, one in 191. Texas is considered a low risk state, believe it or not. Uh, again, you're talking about a ton of area, giant population, a lot of animals down there in Texas, but we're also covering like a quarter of the United States when we're talking land mass there. So let's not uh, let's not freak out too much about Texas. Now, I'm going to jump over medium risk and go straight to the high risk states here, because this is where the Midwest is very present and also some places along the eastern seaboard. Uh, you'll also see the south and kind of the Bible Belt work its way in there. As well, coming in at number six, we already talked about Iowa, one in 63. Michigan is number four at one in 60. Missouri, one in 80. That's number 10 overall. Moving on down the list here, let's get over east. We already talked about West Virginia. Oh, here's another Midwestern state, Wisconsin, one in 60. Moving a little bit to the west and the Great Plains over there, uh, Wyoming, you're one in 83. But, you know, Minnesota shows up on here, Mississippi, Montana. If your state starts with an M, you're screwed. Let's just look at it that way. Uh, Maine is number 15 on the list. One in 83 chance to have a collision with an animal. North Carolina, one in 87. Uh, We already talked about Pennsylvania. South Carolina, one in 83. Virginia, one in 78. It's pretty crazy. I I find Maine. I I never would have expected to find Maine in among the high-risk states, but That's like the furthest one away from me over here in Oregon. So me and Maine, we don't talk much. 
and and then some of your middle risk states, we're talking your Rhode Islands, your New Yorks, Nebraska actually didn't come in as a high risk state, which kind of surprised me. Nebraska at one in one twenty seven. Uh, Massachusetts, the lone M state, making it into the medium risk category, one in 109. You've got your Kansases and Kentuckys on here as well. So uh, just, I guess more than anything, we're saying watch out, okay? Uh, I've got some tips here from State Farm on how to avoid animal collisions. I, I got to be honest, as I'm reading through these, I'm thinking that these are geared towards four-wheelers a lot more than they are geared to professional truck drivers, but we'll go through them anyway. Stay alert. That's number one. I think that's number one on the list of driving in general. Stay alert. Like, I don't know how many times you've taken a nap while you're driving and it's worked out for you. Um, but my guess is that's that's like a zero and zero chance. Use your high beams. They say flicking your high beams on an animal in the road may cause the animal to scurry away. High beams also help illuminate the dark roads. We know this, uh, but I'm going to contradict State Farm here a little bit. And I'm not an insurance company, but I did uh, grow up in an insurance household. My dad and mom ran an insurance company for most of my formative years. And one thing that I always heard from the farmers and the guys that live out in rural Oregon where I grew up in the mountains is that high beams for deer aren't always the best decision. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of stories I heard from these farmers is you flick the high beams on and the deer stare right into them. You've heard the term like a deer in the headlights. I'm pretty sure that's where it comes from. This one goes for everybody. Don't swerve. Just make ground meat out of it. All right. Especially if you're in a big rig, you know that I don't have to tell you swerving to miss an animal causes much worse accidents uh, than what it prevents. So especially if you're packing 80,000 pounds, that deer, it's going to damage the fender. But if you got a Bambi basher on the front or a, a wildlife guard or a cattle guard, whatever you want to call it, you'll be all right. And, and I think that, uh, the owners of these trucks out there would definitely prefer that you just waste the thing at speed. You know, obviously try to slow down, but don't go into the ditch just to miss a deer. Uh, break is necessary is another tip. Remember peak season. That's the whole reason we're having this recurring segment right now. The Bambi report's only going to happen during deer season and, and just a little before it. Remember mealtime. This is one you don't think about. The deer are going to be out at dawn and dusk. That's when they feed. You know, it's kind of like a uh, kind of like a snow bunny uh, or a snowbird, as they like to call them down in Florida. When do you see the old people out on the beach when they're retired in Florida? At, at sun up and sun down. They're not going to be out there during the heat of the day. And the deer don't like it either. Uh, watch for herds. If you see a herd, chances are you don't see that whole damn herd. There's more. There's stragglers. Maybe there's a, uh, you know, a superhero type who's going to go out and cross before the herd. It's always unpredictable. I think that's the biggest point here. Don't use deer whistles. There is no scientific evidence to support that car mounted deer whistles worked. I wish I could have told my late grandpa that uh, he loved those damn things, had them stuck all over the place. I had no idea that there was no scientific evidence that it worked. I will tell you that I don't think he ever hit a deer. So there's that. Uh, and of course, wear your seatbelt. That's all. That's an obvious one. Look, do what you want to do with the high beams. I'm not telling you not to do it. Obviously, this is State Farm. They've taken a lot of people's money over the years. They've put this money into studies to try to make it so they can take more people's money. So I'm no expert, but I do have a lot of experience. And uh, flashing my bright lights at a deer is not something I would think of right before I slam into it. That's going to do it for your Bambi report today. <laughs> I'm not sure how much more like in stats we'll be able to bring you as far as the Bambi report goes this month. Uh, but I'm hoping that we're going to get some stories from drivers about some wildlife incidents out there because it's that time of year. And we all got to be aware that these stupid idiots are going to be out there on the road. Um, and also, you're going to run into a lot of deer. Uh, next up, we got another interview. Let's get to it. Next up here on the H&M Trucking Podcast, it's Hopper Division Manager, Brenda Hampton. And Brenda, thank you so much for being here. It's been a while since we've had you. How's everything going out there in Omaha? Doing good, Marcus. Thank you for asking. Oh, of course. Of course. Now, 
We're doing a quarterly outlook here, and I figured might as well bring on a division manager to talk about how things are looking in that division. Uh, sometimes we talk a little bit more generally on this podcast and, you know, dry van and hopper kind of gets lumped together. But, uh, from your perspective on the hopper side, how's everything going? I'll just ask a very general question right now. Well, you know, I think uh, freight's a little slower, but, uh, it is picking up and I think we're doing good. Drivers staying pretty busy out there, even though the, the freight's running a little bit slower. Oh yeah. We always try and keep the wheels rolling. I mean, We've got to take a hit somewhere we do. But, yeah, we got to keep them rolling, keep them moving, and keep the miles under there. Very good. Now, uh, as far as equipment is concerned, and I don't know if you have a lot to do with this, if this is one of the things that you're you're tasked with, but how's the equipment holding up so far this year? Obviously, we're getting into these winter driving months. I know that equipment's been hard to get hands on lately, but we've also seen some of those beautiful uh, prestige trailers that you guys have got out there in the hopper division. Uh, what's the outlook on equipment looking like right now? Well, you know, we are lucky. We have people that push good equipment through. We are uh, clearing out the the 19 fleets, uh, the high mile fleet, and we're getting low miles, new truck. So the fleet, in my mind, we're looking good on trucks and trailers. That's great. I, I love to hear that because I know that there's some companies out there right now that are struggling with the way that uh, availability has been and parts and everything like that. I actually spoke to a, a different company here uh, a few weeks ago, and they showed me a list of their trucks that they have, and they had more trucks nearing a million miles than they did under half a million miles. And that was kind of it kind of blew me away. I didn't expect to see that, but they're having trouble getting equipment. I mean, it's kind of something that everybody's been a little bit plagued with since COVID, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. COVID really pushed us back on, uh, you know, uh, James is real big, about 500,000 miles on those trucks, pushing them out the door. And, uh, you know, we've been having to hold on to them longer because we don't have any any other equipment. Well, and that's, you know, I, maybe maybe I'm a crazy person. I don't know. You could tell me if, if this is. But I kind of feel like if I was a driver that once I got into a truck and I got, say, 500,000 miles on it, if it was holding up OK, I think I would be more the guy that didn't want to let it go because I was used to it. And it was something that I was comfortable in uh, rather than getting a new one. What's what would you say the the average driver in your division is like? Do they like to get a new truck? Are they super excited about it or do they kind of get sad about letting an old friend go? You know, it kind of depends um, if they're comfortable in the in the equipment they have. Of course, it's going to be hard to get rid of it. Um, but once you see those new shiny ones, man, <laughs> it's hard to say no. Uh, amen to that. I sat in one of the seats of the new Volvos uh, when I was out there at the shop, and I couldn't believe how comfortable it was. I want to get one of those driver's seats just to sit in while I do the podcast, because <laughs> this old rickety piece of crap that I'm sitting in, I'm sure one of these days you're going to hear my voice go up a couple of notches because the thing's going to break, uh, and I'm going to hit some sort of support beam. But... We can have that conversation the day that it happens, Brenda. Um, what else can you tell me about the the division right now? I know I'm kind of asking general questions, but is there anything on your mind that you would want to get out to the drivers that might be listening to this about the Hopper division or H&M in general? You know, the more we take care of equipment, the more we treat things, handle it well, uh, the, the longer you're going to be able to keep that equipment. And the more money we're going to get able to turn over after you're done with that equipment, which bottom line makes H&M money. So other than that, equipment is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's only going to go up. But like I said, we do have some good people here that keep bringing in great equipment. And that's hard for companies to do. Somehow H&M is doing it. Yeah. And I think the uh, hats off to the shop as well for being able to keep the maintenance up on these things and, and get them back out on the road in uh, tip top condition if something does go wrong. You know, I, I know the guys down there at the shop are working hard. Uh, I try to get a hold of Jim for this podcast from time to time. He keeps telling me he wishes I would lose his number. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I know that's out of, uh, well, at least I keep telling myself that's because he's so busy and that's because they're running a real tight ship down there at the shop. Yeah, they are busy, man. You get one out, you got three in. So. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Brenda, uh, we're up against the clock here. I didn't have a whole bunch of time today, but I really appreciate the uh, the update on the outlook for the Hopper Division. Uh, I'm going to let you get back to it. I hope you have a great weekend and uh, we'll be in touch for the next time. OK. All right, Marcus. Nice talking to you. Yep, Good talking to you. That's Brenda Hampton, Hopper Division Manager for H&M Trucking. 
And now, H&M President James Fonda. Joining us next up here on the H&M Trucking Podcast is President of H&M Trucking, James Fonda. We've missed you for the last couple of weeks. James, how you been out there in Omaha? Busy. Uh, yeah? Head down. <laughs> <laughs> Beating my head against the wall. <laughs> I get it, man. I get it. Well, then this will be a good episode for you to come on because this is kind of a, a quarterly outlook episode. We've already talked to Tim Kruger on this episode, and I know based on something that you uh, said to me when we were scheduling this interview, that your thoughts on the freight market as of right now aren't that great. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, you're still you're starting to see uh, small upticks in certain areas. But as a general whole, I just don't see a lot like for the future. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, we think four months. I'm like, I just don't see it. Consumer spending is still out there. Even though we're not in the real retail world, that's that is still a huge driver, a huge factor. I've talked with plenty of other companies that are in other other types of volume besides what we do, and they're all struggling with similar. So it seems to be everybody's in the same boat. I think probably, but for the most part, you know, the, the hop, the mid the hoppers are staying in there. Uh, the bands, the the market fan market was just, you know, the summer just was awful. But now it's you, we saw a pretty good uptick in September. As, uh, and uh, this last week has shown that October it'll continue to uptick, so we'll get kind of hopefully back to where we needed to be. And that's kind of um, crawling into like the the Christmas season and the holidays and everything, where you're going to see a bump regardless, correct? Right. I mean, we don't do much of the retail world, but it gets into our our uh, hazmat and our freeze protect season. So right now, you know, despite what everybody loves the nice fall weather, we want the temperature to drop. <laughs> so it's been all that's when those heaters will light up, and that's where you start making the money for sure. Now, uh, what what are your thoughts on how diesel prices are going? I know they're paying over six bucks a gallon right now in California. That's obviously yeah. having an effect. Yeah, <laughs> everywhere you look, it's not pretty. Can't even speculate on it. You know, it's just we're up, we're kind of just up against the wall at the moment. Sure. Well, let's uh, let's try to turn to a little bit of the brighter side of the future because there's nothing we can do about the freight market other other than grovel about it, and you know, obviously. You you probably have enough of that going on in your day to day. You don't need me to. Hey, add yeah, to it. I will say this: we're we're doing a lot better about getting new customers, and uh, you know the the core business that we're doing, and the base, and the customers that we have now. Uh, we're doing a great job of getting more and more business, uh, really digging into them. So that I'm excited to see Pella Windows, and uh, we we recently started with them like within the year, and we're we're continuing to get more and more and more out of them. So there there are good uplights despite the, the the overall trend. But, you know, the, the baseline, JFL is doing phenomenal. Their cold calling is not, oh, they're, they're, getting, they're getting into some good places. So, you know, it's, it's all it, it all kind of works together. Nice. Well, if if Tim's doing some cold calling, I'll assume that's because he's not moving around as good right now uh, in recovery. <laughs> so are you going to kick him in the other knee as soon as he gets healthy so he stays at his desk and keeps making those cold calls? <laughs> I told him he needs to get, no, he needs to be able to walk again. <laughs> more functional between the departments. Uh, you know, I, but it, it, it's not just them. I'm having the, the Hopper group and the, the Van group kind of restructure the culture. It's going to take some time, but, you know, that, that's, we're building a strong base for, for a better foundation for going, uh, you know, everybody can be a part of sales. It doesn't have to be just a, a handful of people. Absolutely. Uh, how about equipment? How's the outlook there? I know that in the past, uh, especially going all the way back to COVID, that it's been a struggle to get your hands on new equipment. Is that turning around at all? So we, well, you, you know, we got a ton of equipment this year. Uh, the, the stuff for next year, I'm still, I've got Freightliner locked in. Uh, Volvo, I, I know the quantity, but we haven't get about a price. We, we'll, we'll get there though. Yeah. I was hopeful by today we had had something, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm just as stubborn as they are. So, uh, <laughs> it takes two, yeah. right? <laughs> You're right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they're, you know, we're going to get what, what equipment we need for next year. Well, I have no, no, no doubt in that. They flew me out to Virginia last week to go check out what the new Volvo looks like. It's pretty fancy. Yeah. Like, Oh, do you like it? What do you think? I'm like, it looks fucking expensive. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't give them an uh, inch, do you, James? <laughs> oh no, yeah. 
but this is not helping in the, in the equipment world right now, but guys, uh, <laughs> but I mean, they're cool, but yeah, the, you know, I did like the mid roofs. They're, they're increasing the mid roofs back to, to the seven forties. They shrunk from the seven thirties for whatever reason, the cab. So now they've, they've re, uh, they've increased that back out, uh, which is, uh, the drivers are going to love that. They, I mean, these bulbs, they look clean. I'm not going to lie. It was hard not to just sit there like, in awe, but you're like, nope, hold it together. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't give them any bargaining chips because you know you'll be uh, you'll be regretting that once it comes time to sign the check, right? Oh, right. <laughs> so, well, so how about like uh, view from a thousand feet up? The overall health of of H and M trucking uh, heading into quarter four. Uh, what are your thoughts? How are you feeling? Oh, we're doing great. And, you know, having you know now we're done uh, pretty much with sales. We'll learn to a few more pieces of equipment in November, but now we're just getting in new, uh, a couple more new trucks, maybe 12 or 15 or something like that left to uh, uh, get in. And there's uh, eight, eight in processing right now. So it's, it, 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 that's going to take a lot of the pressure off of the shop, a lot of the pressure off of uh, operations, trying to route people back. You know, they just, it will become more efficient again as we're, as we're cleaning up this end of this trade cycle. Now the next new trucks, I thought they were going to come earlier, but now they're kind of pushed back to November, December, which kind of sucks because that means we're going to get them and then turn around and then start getting the next group and, and, you know, one for the next trade cycle. So the, the shop boys aren't going to get much of a break, but fortunately if all goes to plan by in, end of Q2, we should have our whole trade cycle done for next year. And then the trucks that are scheduled for a Q3, Q4 of next year will all be ads. So Great. And that's kind of what this year was cute. It was uh, these last handful of trucks. We net added 23 trucks this year. And so next year I have scheduled to net add 30. Oh, that's great. And last year I added 30. So Okay. Well, anything that takes a little bit of pressure off the guys at the shop is is good by me because Jim uh, Musel over there at the shop keeps telling me that he wishes I would lose his number. And I haven't found a way to do that yet. Uh, but I know <laughs> that's just because he's a busy guy. Um, but I'm going to keep calling him. I, I don't have the other way in my DNA. I just have to, I have to keep beating down his door. So. Oh yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I can be, and will always be his favorite and least favorite person every single day. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> well, except for the days when I call him to try to get him on the podcast, I might usurp you as his least favorite person, but only for a day at a time. So you don't have to worry about uh, me too yeah, much. I think you might only, uh, probably only for an hour. Then he's like back to like, <laughs> oh, man, I should just talk to Marcus because God, now I got to deal James. <laughs> Well, if we tag there's team a reason this that thing, there's that sign the master of headaches on my desk. Right. <laughs> well, it, the way I look at it, if we tag team it, we can keep him on his toes uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, just let me know if you're off for a day and I can I can slip in and uh, take over, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, listen, I know it's a busy day for you. I really appreciate the time. Uh, this has been great to hear from you and, and kind of get the, the view from the top as far as company health is concerned. It sounds like things are going really well for H&M. Uh, we never had a doubt here on this podcast about that, but it's always good to hear from you, my friend, and uh, I hope you have a good weekend, and we'll be in touch. All right. Later. That's going to put a bow on it and wrap up this episode of the H&M Trucking Podcast. I want to thank all of my guests today, Tim Kruger, Brenda Hampton, and of course, President James Fonda for the great interviews. And uh, I did eat up quite a bit of time in the Bambi report today. So we're up against the clock here trying to get out before we run too long. Thank you to everyone that listens as well. You click on this podcast every single week and that's what keeps it going. Tell your friends about it. Tell your parents. Tell your grandparents. Hell, tell your kids. They might enjoy listening to it. Maybe uh, maybe you're one of the drivers that's on it. I would love it if your family got to hear a driver profile uh, of you on your company's podcast. It's just a cool thing, all right? There's not a lot of trucking fleets out there that have podcasts. And uh, dare I say, as I throw my shoulder out patting myself on the back, that H&M Trucking has the best one. We appreciate you guys. Be safe out there and always stay fresh, cheese bags. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the H&M Trucking Podcast. Please leave a review, subscribe, and connect with Marcus over at the H&M Trucking social media channels. And if you're considering a job at H&M, find us at hmtrucking.com. Until next time, stay safe and ahead of the curve drivers.